Welcome to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. We introduce you to the voices of community thought leaders and change makers who are working on solutions that face our fellow individual community members, neighborhoods, cities, and our region. This is George Coster, your host. This episode is part of our series exploring COVID-19's impact on nonprofits and small businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area. Back in April of 2020, when we decided to create this ongoing series on COVID-19's impact, first on nonprofits and then on small businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area, we, like you, had no idea how long the pandemic would go on and what the health and economic impact would be in our community. Even with vaccinations slowly increasing for adults, new vaccinations for children, and boosters for adults, as we go into the fall and winter of 2021, we're seeing a potential fourth wave of COVID-19 with cases and deaths increasing. This all adds to the ongoing uncertainty of our ever-changing indoor and outdoor vaccinated and unvaccinated protocols and the politics of the pandemic that will drive how we all come back together as a unified or fractured community. We will continue to shine a spotlight on the nonprofits and small businesses that make up the fabric of our community, along with the founders and staff who are struggling to deal with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their operations, services, and sustainability until we can all get to the other side of the pandemic. Along the way, we will also share with you all the amazing solutions that our nonprofits, small businesses, foundations, and government leaders are working on to help us all get to the other side of the pandemic and come together to rebuild our communities with more economic, social, and environmental equality. I think uh, the medical establishment has been clear that housing is health, and particularly in our community, where a uh, high rate of poverty, high rate of unemployment, uh, significant concentration of renter households, the racial and ethnic diversity is probably first or second in terms of the most diverse communities. Those communities have all been suffering from oppression and disinvestment in a variety of ways, and the COVID crisis merely exacerbated those existing conditions of poverty and racism that have shackled our communities for so long. This is the executive director of Hospitality House, Joe Wilson. Hospitality House is a San Francisco-based nonprofit that is focused on working with our unhoused community members through providing wraparound support services staffed with both formerly unhoused and formerly incarcerated persons. In addition to highlighting their work and solutions, we wanted to feature their unique community arts program, which sees art as both an agent of healing and change. I'm joined remotely by the Executive Director, Joe Wilson of Hospitality House, the Director of Community Engagement of Hospitality House, Wendy Click, and the Manager of Hospitality House's Community Arts Program, Janet Williams. Welcome to Voices of the Community, Janet, Joe, and Wendy. I'd like to start out with you, Joe, just to provide us, if you will, the kind of global overview of Hospitality House, which has been working in the Tenderloin and South America for many decades. Thank you, George. Hospitality House started in the spring of the Summer of Love in 1967 as an effort for the community to have a safe, welcoming space, particularly for young people who had come to California and specifically San Francisco, seeking a better life, a bad home environment, seeking welcoming and acceptance. We have evolved from a simple drop-in space to six programs now in five different locations in three different neighborhoods. Over the course of a year, we reach more than 20,000 community residents, meeting a variety of ways to get connected to the community, to get back on their feet, to discover their art artistic and creative impulse and to find ways to contribute positively to the community through civic engagement, community organizing, and civic participation. We believe very strongly at Hospitality House that everyone in the community is a potential asset. We think our added value is that many of our staff have traveled the same roads as community members. We are proud of the fact that we are very much invested in the peer-based model, meaning that we hire from the community, the people who run the program, like the people who use 
the programs, starting with the executive director, myself. I'm a former shelter resident at the Hospitality House Shelter. And any organization that is willing to believe in the potential of every individual that comes through the door, I think is an asset for the city and county of San Francisco. And we're very proud of the fact that our senior leadership team also reflects the diversity in our community. A 15-person leadership team out of a total staff of 85, 10 women, 5 men. The leadership team, 12 people of color, 11 of them had different jobs in the organization before they became members of the senior leadership team. And I think that is a strong case for believing and investing in the real potential of every individual in the community. Thank you. Good overview. And uh, you have a very unique background. It's a really wonderful example of how Hospitality House walks the talk. Wendy, turning to you, you're the manager of Hospitality House's Outreach. Could you share with the audience a little bit about the various programs? Thank you. Yes, we do have two drop-in centers, one on 169 6th Street and 146 Leavenworth. Those two are open for anyone to come on in and get respite. If they need case management, we have case management on site. If they want to see a harm reduction therapist, they can go and make an appointment with a harm reduction therapist. So you can get hygiene kits. If you just want respite off the street and relax, you can go into our drop-in centers. So we have our employment program at 181 6th Street and 146 Leavenworth in the basement. So those will help people with cover letters and resumes, help you with barriers. If you need an ID, we can help provide you with a voucher to get a discount on an ID. If you need a mock interview, that's a part of the appointment program as well. We do employer spotlights for some employers for our, our community members. So every week there is a couple of employer spotlights and then you can have your cover letter and resume and an interview at that point. We have our community building program. So the community building program holds themed self-support groups. So there's usually a women's group, there's a men's group, there is a queer group, and we have a group called the Healing Organizing Leadership Development. It's an eight-week program. So you start off with healing, what is trauma, how does it affect your body, identifying emotions, and then we move into Civics 101. Usually at the end, we do have a trip to City Hall when they allow us in and they meet the district supervisors. And we do oversee a shelter in place hotel. During COVID, we were impacted because we were the smallest but oldest shelter and we are now operating a shelter in place hotel. I would talk about the community's arts program, but Janet is here. So I think that she could give a better overview of the arts program. Great, Wendy. And good segue to you, Janet. One of the unique parts of Hospitality House is the community arts program. Yeah, we're a free drop-in, open to everyone, low threshold, harm reduction arts center on Market Street. So essentially anyone that wishes to come through the doors, will welcome them in, check in, say, what do you want to make today? What do you want to express? If someone wants to come in and just do some simple like doodles, that's great. If someone wants to come in and work towards an exhibition and creating their whole art practice, we'll also support it. It's every level and every interest and every medium. Our whole thing is to just get people in the door, get them making art and get them making art together in a community so that they can grow and support each other as they're all working through their art practice. I think one of the unique parts of that is the community arts program provides materials for folks for free. Mm -hmm. Free art space in San Francisco. It's been a long time since there's been any other one. We're the only one, which is great because people come in the door and they don't believe it for a while. So you have this few minutes where you're like, no, it's actually free. Do you want canvas? Do you want paint? There's no hidden cost. This is actually free. And so working with people from that point on, it's just beautiful to be able to give a lot of people who haven't gotten things. They've been told no's all day long and then they come to one of our programs and then they get a lot of yeses. So it's special to be able to provide that for people. And you were also providing exhibit space as well, as I recall? Yeah, the space we work out of used to be an old luggage store. So we've got two beautiful big windows that are full of natural light that we put all the artwork made in the art program in the windows. And we theme it so it's different. Like right now we have the lovable show. So it's wearable and usable art that looks kind of cute, you know, for selling for the holidays. And so the artists make the art here. We'll curate the show, hang it in the window, 
Uh, we'll have an exhibition opening. It's usually quite a fun community get together, get some live music going. And then all the artwork is for sale and the artists get 100% of whatever price they set for their piece. So right now we've got 15 t-shirts in the window the artists created themselves. They all set the price at 30 bucks and then someone comes by, wants to buy it as a gift for themselves, as a cool t-shirt for their family. And then the artists get some money so they actually can build up a little social enterprise and some financial independence through all their hard work and their creativity. That's great. Turning back to you, Joe, how has COVID-19 impacted hospitality houses operation? Wendy had mentioned gone from your shelter to actually operating the hotel programs, the SIP hotels. So how has COVID-19 impacted hospitality houses? Well, in a number of ways, I think certainly the example of what happened with our emergency shelter, where we were the first adult shelter in the city to move our residents out of the congregate shelter into privately funded hotel rooms. I think uh, the medical establishment has been clear that housing is health, and particularly in our community, where a uh, high rate of poverty, high rate of unemployment, uh, significant concentration of renter households, the racial and ethnic diversity is probably first or second in terms of the most diverse communities. Those communities have all been suffering from oppression and disinvestment in a variety of ways. And the COVID crisis merely exacerbated those existing conditions of poverty and racism that have shackled our communities for so long. And so part of our effort really making the decision and keeping our doors open to remain an available asset for the community. We had to reduce our daily capacity in terms of complying with COVID safety protocols. We significantly invested in you know, cleaning, site sanitation, air circulation, purification machines. I think indoor air quality is going to be a huge issue, frankly, in the nonprofit sector. We had to also suspend many of our support groups for much of the past 12 to 14 months. And so that encouraged us to be more creative in how we were maintaining connections with people phone, direct outreach, doing more Zoom-oriented workshops, certainly through the art program. A number of engagements through the community building program were happening via telephone contact, became very important. Periodic wellness checks in the community were especially crucial for people who were already isolated. And it taught us really the importance of community in this effort of juggling with the concept of staying safe meant staying apart from each other. We had to think of creative ways to bring each other together and remind us of the importance of human contact, eye contact, smiles, touch even from a distance when we couldn't embrace uh, was very important for folks. And I think it certainly reminds all of the importance of these community-based organizations that spring out of the community, owe their existence to the community, and have an obligation to give back in times of crisis. And that's exactly what the Hospitality House staff did over this past 15, 18 months. It has been truly remarkable to see the dedication that people feel for the community that many of them grew up with, grew up in, or communities just like the Tenderloin and South of Market. And I've been truly inspired and in working with the Hospitality House staff over the duration of this pandemic. Thank you. And turning to you, Wendy, since you're out in the community and you're trying to bring programs back, how is it going? It's been delightful. We didn't really close our doors that long. So we've been open pretty much throughout the pandemic. It's like what Joe was saying is that the capacity, usually our drop-in centers are full. We had to limit that to down to 10 folks. And then our community building program, we had to limit it to five. So it was a part of learning how to be more creative and doing more outreach to people on the street. Some people do case management on the street. That way we know where someone's at and they know that they're not alone. A part of that is building the bridge of knowing that when you're isolated, we're still there. Hospitality house isn't going anywhere. On 6th Street, the program, their peer advocates would go out and pass out hygiene kits to the people outside or just having a conversation and passing out coffee. Thing like just continue to outreach to folks to remind them that we do have our services and that our hours are still available for all the community to come in. Some of our employment program, they did case management outside, helped them with their resume outside with their laptops. So we just found a creative way to make sure that the community knew that hospitality house is still there. 
Staying with you, Wendy, do you feel with the economy starting to come back within the jobs or employment program, are more folks getting hired? Are there more opportunities for jobs? I would say yes, there's a lot more employer spotlights. So it gives opportunity for our community members to retain employment. And that's a part of hospitality houses that we have our close relationships with our community members and the employer so that we can continue that relationship even after their employment to keep that going with them. And Janet, how has coming back with the arts program since doing art is an in-person kind of an experience? Like Wendy said, we never really went away, but we have just been adapting as best we can given what resources are out there. So for a long time, we were filling up a little red wagon and bringing it down to the local park and having art in the park days because at the time we could only have four people inside, but we could fit 12 people on picnic benches that were in a nearby park. So that was a really lovely and um, unexpected benefit of the pandemic because making art outside in the trees and being able to do so much better outreach because we're already there. And um, so being able to do that as part of outreach and reopening. And then we've been gradually having a lot of new faces come in, actually, because a lot of people, their lives got turned upside down and they needed a foundation to, to rebuild themselves back up from. So leaning into art, leaning into self-expression has been something that's been really helpful to people that who maybe didn't need it or didn't see a value in it beforehand. And so we've got a lot of new faces and then a lot of our familiar faces who've been coming for years, but they're now so much more tight knit as a community because we've all kind of been through it together now. And so it's been beautiful seeing how everyone's just banded even tighter together and then the new faces. But we're still not back to full capacity. I still long for the days that there'd be 30 artists all making art on top of each other and there's paint flying and there's glitter going everywhere and it's quite the scene. Um, another benefit is that because we have limited capacity, each individual artist that does get in, because it's first come, first served, they have much more space and can use up much more materials. Like we don't have to ration as much as we used to. So it's been this nice quality slash quantity balance um, where the artists have been able to make larger projects and focus deeper and then connect with each other on a more intimate level because there's only eight people rather than 30 um, so it's been interesting and um, every turn, every change, we try and do it to relate to what the community are asking for. So when they're saying, I want to make art, we're like, well, let's just go outside. Or if they're saying, I want to learn things, I'm like, OK, let's go on Zoom and do a class via Zoom. And um, so we're just really responding to the community and what they're asking for and what they're needing. Love the image of uh, glitter flying and paint flying. So, Joe, coming back to you, you've been there for a while. What do you feel has been the, one of the largest impacts of Hospitality House on our unhoused community, but our low-income community members in South America and the Thames Lane? Well, I think for many of us, it's reaffirming that their lives matter, their voices matter, that they're not perceived liabilities. They are potential assets in everything that we do. The essence of is a common theme and thread. I think both Wendy and Janet point out that ultimately, wherever there's life, wherever there's people, there's community. And we've learned a real lesson from that. I think that is a replicable model for other organizations to emulate. The additional part of our work also occupies space on three levels with the individual the broader community, and then across communities and neighborhoods. So we are also community builders and coalition builders in our work. And so that really speaks to the necessity of addressing the conditions that require a hospitality house to exist in the first place, where there is fundamental injustice, there is fundamental inequity, there is fundamental inequality that it is our job to do something about that. People rebuild their lives. We must also be mindful of the need to rebuild society in some way. And we've learned the hard way through this crisis that resources, the nonprofit sector very much exists or is a product of the scarcity model. There is not enough to go around. So hard choices need to be made. We believe that we need to invert that, like hard choices need to be made so there is more to go around. And that is part of our approach to what we do. We have example after example of systems that are in place to reduce the scale of the problem so it meets the available solution, which is ass backwards. 
we need to grow the solution so it meets the scale of the problem. And for us at Hospitality House, because we have chosen to really not only connect individuals back to the community, but build a community around each individual, it teaches us that how much we need each other in order to not only survive, but to thrive. Artworks are evident in all of our programs. It speaks to the fact that the creative impulse lives within each of us. The desire to create, to imagine better, that is also a part of Hospitality House's core vision and core mission, that we can imagine better, that together we can achieve more, we can achieve better if we believe it first. And so first and foremost, when you look at who's on this podcast, there are examples of people being told that they could not do a certain thing or they could only achieve a certain amount or a certain level. They have burst through that perceived glass ceiling to really achieve more for themselves and their community. That is the essence of hospitality. Thank you. Janet, what do you feel has been the biggest impact of the arts program? I think it's just really the bonds and the connection and the gratitude I think everyone that comes here now, not that they ever took it for granted much before, but everyone just comes in so thankful, so happy that we're still open. And then it comes out in their art. Their art has got energy. And then they're supporting each other even more so because they now know that we had each other's back and we stuck together. And that's a bond that does not like dissolve over time. I'm hoping it continues much longer than the pandemic because it's the community that we build and the community that we strengthen. That's been beautiful to see. And Wendy, what do you feel has been the biggest impact of a specific program? At our community building program, we have a group, it's called Committed to Change. And in the beginning of the pandemic, the Committed to Change was for formerly incarcerated folks. So our community members that have recently released from jails, prisons, some of them have been detained out in ICE and have been released. So in the beginning of the pandemic, it was very small. And recently it's grown more and more. So a part of that is just the outreach of people that are already still incarcerated, writing Hospitality House, asking what we can provide them with. And what we can provide them with is just resources that we have within our agency, but also outside our agency. But we also have that community. So today, part of the Committed to Change, because it's bi-weekly, but two weeks ago, it had 23 people were just recently released. So a part of that is that we build community with them. We offer them clothing. We offer them like a hygiene from different outlooks and different donations that we've received. And they're not the same that you get in an institution. It's something totally different. The clothing is totally different. So you're out of your comfort zone because you're used to this, but now we're asking you to do this. And they are so grateful because I was formerly incarcerated. So it just shows that we look like the people that we serve. Recently, there was a gentleman that was there that was released after 43 years. He came in, he was a little nervous. He sat down and he talked to the group and then we referred him to our employment program a couple of weeks later after he got his identification and social security. Now he's got full-time employment, but he still continues to come to the community building program, sits there and he says, this was the first place that ever made me feel like I wasn't a menace to society. So we're just like, no, we look like the people that we serve. And all of us here right now have been formerly incarcerated. So we just want you to feel comfortable here. So the group is getting bigger and bigger. But it also is the community part. If we didn't have the community part for me, I was formerly incarcerated. I didn't have the community until I came to Hospitality House and they allowed me to be who I was and who I am. And Wendy, staying with you, how can people who are listening to the show help either a particular program? And then I'm going to go to Joe. We have the Hospitality House website with the donation button, if that's what you really feel anxious and itching to do, but also to just to, to get to know our programs. If you have a certain interest, like the Committed to Change, we ha- we take donations of hygiene it, and it don't, it could be a tube of toothpaste, a general toothbrush. And that just, it gives us a long ways with someone, but it, it, it's all of our programs are unique and they all have their own special needs. And I, I feel like Joe could probably answer that one much better than I can because, you know, 
<laughs> we have the holidays are coming and the giving Tuesday is coming. So if you feel like you want to just give to Hospitality House, I will be greatly, I will appreciate and thank you from the bottom of my heart. So I will turn it over to the next person. <laughs> so um, back to you for a moment, Joe. Can folks volunteer these days? And and we were talking earlier about, about employment and employers, hopefully showing up and, and providing uh, more job opportunities. But how can folks get engaged? engaged in supporting Hospitality House, obviously cash is always good. What are some of the other ways, whether it's products, services, volunteer, mentorship, jobs? All of those things. We need all those things. I think that first and foremost, it's you know a sense of connection that matters most. We have a range of donors, you know, for $10 a month, you become a sustaining donor. That adds up to $120 every year. $120 gets someone a, a, a fast pass and a pair of shoes. We always need donations of interview appropriate clothing for our, our job program. We always need, always need donations of art supplies for our arts program. We need mentors. We need IT experts. We need folks willing to share their own skills in particular fields with Hospitality House. But again, first and foremost, it's a sense of community. The Hospitality House has survived for nearly 55 years now. We'll be celebrating our 55th year in March. Next April will be our 36th annual art auction, where we have an opportunity to sell the talents and gifts of neighborhood artists alongside more well-known, nationally recognized artists. But again, it's a sense of connection. Learn a little bit about our story. We owe our existence to community volunteers. So that is the lifeblood of hospitality. People donating personal protective equipment, masks, sanitation supplies, hand sanitizers, cleaning supplies, those all come in. $25 is enough to provide individually packaged meals for three people, which we've had to transition in terms of providing meals for folks. We're not a restaurant or a food service, so we exist on donations from the community in terms of restaurants providing these individually packaged meals, which has been an adjustment for us. But I would say get on our website, learn a little bit about Hospitality House's story, figure out what piques your interest, give us a call, come by and see us. And when we are in a room together or a meeting together at Hospitality House, it's a room full of second chance. And when people believe in better for themselves, when they believe in better possibilities, miracles and magic happen. And that's what happens every day and multiple moments every day at Hospitality House. Thank you. And Janet, turning to you, could you share with the audience one of your favorite stories of working in the in the community arts program? Yeah, I read the question earlier and I was, there's so many things that came to my mind. I guess it's, it's not necessarily one of my favorite stories, but it's one of the stories that I understood Hospitality House when it happened. And it was my third day working here. And I was in a different position that I'm in now. And I came in and there was a man sitting there and he looked very disheveled, was grumbling to himself. And I sat beside him and he was making noises, but I couldn't just differentiate any words. And he's like, I just kind of sat beside him. I was like, "Mm mm-hmm, okay, yeah. Uh, Just acknowledging his existence. And after a few minutes, he stopped and exhaled and he turned to me and he goes, thanks for listening. And in that moment, I understood what we're here to do. It's validating someone. It's acknowledging that their existence, it's not turning your head and being like, oh, that's some grumbly dude in the corner. It's being like, no, you're a human here and you have something to say. And I unfortunately can't understand what you're saying right now, but I'm valuing that it's a, it's a, it's an important thing to say. And then the minute I saw that he, that's all he needed, that I, in that minute, I was hooked. I was like, this is it. This is what we need to be doing everywhere. And then from that point on, there's just been 10 million amazing interactions with people that you just see. I think also seeing people when they get here first and then seeing over time, the transition and the complete like, phoenix from the ashes transformation that they do in front of you both in their artwork and then in their personality like seeing people people arrive being very quiet and almost not able to lift their head up to make eye contact to like leading a karaoke song or like strutting in a catwalk that we had last thursday it's just so beautiful to see people blossom once they feel safe and seen and held so that's what we're here to do thank you nice story how about you wendy favorite story or just a story 
a story. I would, I can't say I have a favorite story because they're all just emotionally tied to me. When I came to Hospitality House, I was a substitute on-call peer advocate. So when I worked on call, they would call me to the shelter. And I noticed that there was this gentleman sleeping on the street in front of our, our building. And I would say, hi, how you doing? And then years have gone by. He would still be in front of our shelter building, just laying there. And I was like, why don't you ever get a shelter reservation? He said, no, I'm safe here. It's been nine years. He's been sleeping in front of our building from 290 Turk to 146. We've all come to know him. And at one point he was going through chemotherapy, but he would, he'd rather just sleep in front of hospitality house because he knew he was safe there. So recently he just got housed. Every day I see him, he shows me his keys. That's a part of what hospitality house is. He slept, I don't know how long he's been houseless, but he stayed in front of hospitality house all these years until recently he's housed. He will come to 290 Turk to knock on the door and ask them to tell me that he's there only for me to come outside to show me his keys. So that's a part of that community part is like seeing him, knowing that he's safer in his own, but he just wants me to know every day that if it wasn't for a hospitality house, he don't think that he would ever be housed. Great story. How about you, Joe? It's hard to top, but the attorney who founded the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson, wrote this book, uh, Just Mercy. There's a quote out of that book that says, uh, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And I think for us, we find out every day that each of us is more than the worst day we've ever had. And one of my better days was not so long after... I'd come to Hospitality House, someone who was working there, and we've now been friends for 35 years or so, sent me out on my first paying job after I'd been homeless. And the first paycheck I got in the mail after having been homeless, I got at Hospitality House using Hospitality House as a mailing address. And so I remember the moment when... I'm in the middle of the drop-in center floor opening, seeing that envelope that had my name on it. And I'd lost so much in the experience of being homeless and houseless, but I hadn't lost my name and someone had found me. And it was uh, a profound reminder of what humanity and identity can mean to an individual. And I think each of those stories reflect that, the power of humanity, the power of identity, what we can all be for each other. And for me, it was a sense of belonging, and I still mattered despite my circumstances. And someone had cared enough about me to get help me get to a better place. And the reward was I knew that I still had my name and that stayed with me. I think we've had to educate ourselves about trauma, the trauma of poverty, the trauma of isolation, the trauma of loneliness and exclusion and judgment. Each of us have grappled with reconciling for ourselves that at least we can remind people that we are not judging them. We see them in that moment for who they can be and who they are. And despite the trappings or the absence of trappings of their circumstance, they are still that human being to us because we are equal in that moment. And I think we've all had to reconcile that for ourselves and how powerful and necessary that is. So my story reflects part of that, where in that moment I mattered and I was in a place that allowed me to feel that. Thank you. Great stories. I'm going to turn to our final question for everybody. And I'm going to start with you, Janet. What do you think are some of the positive things that could come out of the pandemic to support our artists in our community or perhaps the unfound artists in our community? I think the pandemic has given everyone a forced pause to to reflect, to take stock, to look around. And in this, I've seen and hope to see more of people really connecting with their own creativity appreciating other others creativities I think when life is busy it's easy to walk by a wall covered in paintings and not stop and look at it or to walk by someone doing a sketch and not be curious enough to look over and say what are you doing and so I think in this forced pause it gives us a chance to connect to connect with each other and connect with art 
And um, so I hope that we don't lose that. And I hope that we can keep those um, those connections going and because that just makes makes more art happen, makes artists more supported and gets the art valued properly. Thank you. And Wendy, how about you? What are some of the positive things that could come out of this? My hope and my belief is that we have a stronger community, that we're all in the same situation as the pandemic, but also, too, as we're all living and learning how to live daily day, but we're also building community in the way that we haven't normally done. There are connections that we've made with our unhoused and our folks in the community that we haven't been able to. So bringing those, bringing that community and that relationship together, just bringing us stronger and stronger every day. Thank you. And Joe, ending with you, what are some of the positive things um, that you feel could come out of the proverbial uh, pandemic and economic meltdown? It's hard to top that. It is the power of community, the capacity of human beings to strive for better, even in the worst of circumstances. There will be another crisis that confronts us. I think Hospitality House has acquitted itself quite well during this pandemic, people have had to summon up quite a bit from within them. And some of us may not have known that we had that (laughs) inside us, that capacity within us. That's what a crisis can do. You see the worst people, you can also see the best. We have seen more of the best of each other. And I think that hopefully our elected officials, our decision makers and leaders have Had it reaffirmed to them the importance of everybody needing a place to be, how important the investments we make in housing and equity of opportunity. One of the real lessons that I've learned or had reaffirmed during this crisis is the people who are overrepresented in the problem have to be overrepresented in the solution for there to be true equity. If you start out behind in the race, you have to run faster than everybody else just to get. And we need to set ourselves on that path of what true equity and true justice means for all of our communities. We have the wherewithal to do that. All that matters now is the will to do it. And I think these individual examples, these stories that you hear recounted about Hospitality House serve us well on that path forward, that it is possible if we are only willing to strive for it. And that closing line from Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem about if only we are brave enough to be it is what we need to reaffirm for ourselves. And Hospitality House, I believe, has been on the vanguard of that. Nice way to to end it with Gorman's poem. That was super powerful. Thank you, Joe, Wendy, and Janet for sharing Hospitality House's work today. We'll make sure that the listeners have your contact information, website, and social media so they can follow Hospitality House and get engaged in the work to help our Tenderloin South America housed, unhoused, and artistic community members. And I want to thank all of you for really sharing such wonderful information about Hospitality House. And please stay safe and healthy as we work our way out to this pseudo new normal. Thank you very much. That's it for this episode of Voices of the Community. You've been listening to the voices of the Executive Director of Hospitality House, Joe Wilson, the Director of Community Engagement of Hospitality House, Wendy Click, along with the Manager of Hospitality House's Community Arts Program, Janet Williams. To find out more about Hospitality House and to volunteer, along with donating funds and art supplies, please go to hospitalityhouse.org. We hope that you enjoyed the insights, points of view, and personal stories from the voices of changemakers and their nonprofits and small businesses featured in this series. To find out more and get engaged with the nonprofits, small businesses, and staff members featured in this series, please go to my website, georgecoster.com and click on Voices of the Community to find links to the extended versions of these interviews and to listen to the entire series. After listening to these stories, we hope that you will consider making a donation and volunteering to provide a hand up to your fellow community members. I want to thank my associate producer, Eric Estrada, and Casey Nance at Citron Studios, along with the wonderful crew at the San Francisco Public Press and KSFP. Voices of the Community is a member of Intersection for the Arts, which allows us to offer you a tax deduction for your contributions. Please go to georgecoster.com and click on the donate link to make a donation to help us provide future shows 
just like this one. While you're on our website, you can enjoy our archived past shows, which feature community voices working on solutions to critical issues facing Northern California communities. And you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about future shows, as well as shows and events from the organizations that are included in our episodes. Take us along on your next COVID walk by subscribing to Voices of the Community on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at George Coster, and we'd love to hear from you with feedback and show ideas, so send us an email to george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster in San Francisco, and thank you for listening.